Lovely. So good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening for what is going to be a very special and fantastic tasting with uh, the Barton family. Uh, it's amazing that this has been a sold out event. Uh, so clearly a very, very popular uh, tasting and a great opportunity for us to share many a tasty uh, tiny bottles of wine uh, from the comfort of our own home. Uh, so hopefully you're all uh, keeping safe and well and able to enjoy these uh, all this evening. Um, and yeah, very much looking forward uh, to tasting these along with you. Uh, we've got people joining us from all over the country. Uh, so it's fantastic that we're getting just outside of uh, Bristol now and uh, talking to everyone and sharing our love for what is going to be a fantastic tasting. Very happy to be joined by Damien and Lillian from uh, the Barton family who are going to chat through the wires this evening. If you do have any questions uh, throughout the tasting, please pop them into the chat. Uh, myself and Louise. Louise, give us a wave. Good evening. <laughs> we'll be monitoring the chat and feeding any questions through uh, as we go through. Um, so yeah, feel free to use that. If you've got any comments, feedbacks about the wine, uh, we do want to hear what you're saying because otherwise I'm just here alone in a cellar drinking alone so uh, please do let us know what you think as we go through hopefully you've all uh, got a little bit of cheese or some nibbles on the go as well uh, which will help uh, bind with the uh, complex flavors and uh, that we have within the wines and help soften some of those tannins bring forth some extra delicious uh, tasty flavors so uh, without further ado i'm gonna shut up and stop talking and <laughs> pass over to david uh, so yeah thank you very much and welcome Good evening, Thank everyone. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, Fly as well. <laughs> She'll be trying the wines too. Nice. <laughs> Hello, Fly. No, she's gone. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. It's great to be such a large number uh, around Zoom. It's um, it's maybe not as um, warm and uh, and friendly as as it can be uh, if I was in Bristol with you. Regardless, uh, we're very happy to still be able to maintain a bit of a contact slightly differently. Um, I'll be, so with, with Lillian, we'll be uh, sharing the screen, telling you a little bit about uh, the history, the, the story of the different wines. And uh, as long as you can bear with uh, terrible, boring maps that I love to show, um, We'll, uh, you know, we'll keep going. Don't hesitate to put any question in the in the chat box next to this, and uh, let's let's get going. Um, Lydian, why don't you start? Uh -huh. um, well, perhaps we can start with a, a bit of boring family history, in that um, we're an Irish family. Uh, Damien also has an Irish passport. And we came from Ireland to, to Bordeaux in 1600, um, where eventually we started a Nigos company in the 1720s. And it's not till, uh, and there's the family tree, thank you. So Thomas came to Bordeaux and then his son, William. He wasn't very nice and no good, so we don't really talk about him too much. And uh, he had a son called Hugh, who uh, did very well at the Negos business, but he had a slight problem. Uh, um, it fell during the French Revolution. So he was actually imprisoned for a while in, in uh, the Fort du A in Bordeaux. And uh, rumors has it he escaped uh, dressed as a woman. His wife, Anna Johnson, bought women's clothes and he ended up in Ireland uh, where he bought um, a property in Kildare called Stratham House, now known as the K Club. Uh, but I think the truth is that uh, he got some papers because we've got them that said, uh, toi citoyen, we allow you to travel. And I think he went to England and then back to, and back to Ireland and, and bought the property. Uh, and when uh, Hugh came back in the 1820s, the law had changed because before that, if foreigners bought land, when they died, uh, the property went back to the crown and not to the descendants. So not being totally stupid, we didn't uh, buy anything then. Uh, and then when Hugh came back in, in the 1820s, uh, for a start, the man who looked after the negociant so well was made a partner. 
hence Barton and Gettier. And uh, he bought Longwa in 1821, which in fact is, is the, the very pretty Chartreuse is what you call the, the type of building that Longwa is. And um, uh, with, uh, there we are, there's, uh, there's Longwa. Uh, where I don't thank my ancestors is that they put the Chateau Longwa on the Leoville Barton label. So try and explain that one is a bit difficult sometimes. Um, and it's not till um, five years later that um, again, Hugh bought part of the Leoville um, estate, which of course we named Leoville Barton. And it was for sale because uh, the Marquis de Lascaz had also been imprisoned during the French Revolution. And we uh, and asked my ancestor, Hugh, to buy some of the vines to help him out and he was supposed to buy it back. Anyway, rumors has it he rather enjoyed partying in Paris and never bought that bit back. And it's not till this uh, generation, so seventh and eighth generation owners of uh, Longwa and Leoville, that we bought a new property, which is uh, Mauvais and Barton. And it's not in Saint Julien this time, but it's in Moulis. And I was saying I'm sitting in the cellars with the barrel cellars behind. And um, so it's nice to have several generations working on the property. Great, thank you very much for this uh, good history. It's, um, while you were talking, I was having a look at uh, all the couples behind the, behind the, the screen. It's wonderful. It's, uh, it's amazing to see how many of you are, are behind the computer. So it's not only 90, 97 people behind the screen, it's uh, most of the time doubled by two. So um, very excited to see all of you behind. Thank you very much for following. Yeah, thank you for inviting us in your drawing rooms. Um, well, why don't I start boring you a little bit with a few maps, because I think to really understand uh, Saint-Julien and, and Moulis is what we're going to have. Um, I love explaining a little bit about Bordeaux, um, because uh, no, just to, as a little reminder, so we have the Atlantic Ocean there on the left, and the city of Bordeaux is what Saint Grey. Obviously, this map um, is what we say in French, Chauvin, which means we're very proud of where we come from. So this map totally ignores the right bank. It's, we don't talk about the right bank, of course. saint emilion and Pomerol is just a myth. Uh, so, um, so here we're on the left bank and we have so a little vineyard in Moulis, um, the, the orange dots where, where the vineyard is actually located near Castelnau, so really, really at the tip of the appellation. And then we have Saint-Julien. And this map is very interesting because uh, let me uh, grab another um, another map. Uh, you could see, you could almost over, um, um, you know, apply it above this map and really understand why we don't plant vineyards absolutely everywhere in Bordeaux, but just at certain places. Um, the colors of this map um, shows the age of soils of Bordeaux. Um, which obviously gives a proper idea of what you find under your feet. Um, but it's quite interesting to see that what makes the left bank so famous, you can see this light green that we call Pleistocene, is actually very recent. The numbers you see is the age in million years old. So it's, it's a soil that's about one million years old is something that's very recent in terms of geology. And the reason for this is glacier periods. So what happened in um, about a million years ago and in frequent sequences, there was, um, um, well, it was um, ice age and there was a big glacier that came down from the Pyrenees, taking all the stone with it. And as it melted, it would deposit a layer of all the gravels and, and clay and everything it accumulated with all these hundreds, and hundreds of kilometers from the Pyrenees down to the Atlantic Ocean. It would melt, it would leave layers of sometimes sand, sometimes clay, sometimes gravel. And this is why, for example, if you have a look on the right bank, we do see a little bit there. And everybody, I'm sure, have heard that uh, places like Fijac or Cheval Blanc are famous for their gravels. And places like Petrus are very famous for their clay. So that's 
again a river deposit from that time and you can see we're very well equipped on the left bank and obviously saint julien like margot like Poyac, is extremely famous for its uh, gravels um unlike saint julien uh, you can see we where my little uh, cross is um there's actually an orange dot orange it tends to be more um, it's a lot older. You can see it's about 56 million years old. So that's definitely a lot older, um, but it's some kind of chalk. Uh, so it's very old limestone. What's in yellow, obviously the Saint-Emilion is famous for its limestone, is what I, you see behind me. This is limestone and this is what Bordeaux was mostly built of. Um, and on the left bank, you can see there's just a few spots around Saint-Estef, Médoc and the back of Moulis, where Mauvaisin Barton is situated, we have limestone and, and clay on top. And this explains why we have a lot of Merlot and on the, the gravels, we plant a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's just to, to understand why we don't, you know, the reason why we plant certain grape varieties in some places more than others. So, um, well, let's start. Why don't we open a, a, a little bottle of wine? A good idea. It's getting thirsty work around here. So I think we will start with the Mauvaisin. I'm not quite sure which vintage I've picked up. I um, need my glasses around here. So the 2014 from um, Mauvaisin Barton. Um, so Mauvaisin, as Lillian said, was bought in, um, in 2011. And uh, it needed- It's anniversary. Yes, 10 years. Um, so it needed a bit of a uh, work on it um, because the the vineyard uh, was what we call a fermage. It was it was um, well, Lillian, what do, would you know where how we say fermage? Uh, it was in fact rented out to the farmer, and it wasn't the owner looking after the land. Hmm, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it has a real term to it. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but that means that uh, he didn't do much investment. So we spend a lot of energy, um, well, first redoing the winery, which is uh, which part you can see behind Lillian, uh, as she's sitting in the tasting room with the barrel room behind, but a lot of work in, in the vineyards. And uh, yes, very happy with, with the wine now. And I think 14 was a real, a real step up in terms of, of quality. Um, again, dominated by Merlot, uh, with some Cabernet Sauvignon, because obviously we do have a bit of gravel, some Cabernet Franc, uh, unusual amount for the left bank, as we're around 16, 16 to 20%. Uh, I would lie if I gave you an exact blend. Um, and a touch of Petit Verdot, it's a very classic blend for the left bank, regardless. I think there's even sort of about 20, uh, 20 vines of Carmenère in Yes, at the time, we, we still had the old pot that we pulled out last year. Um, well, obviously, there's on the, on the label, there is um, an image of the chateau, um, but it's always, um, it always makes more sense when you, when you see the chateau. So let me show you a couple of pictures. Um, it's, it's a real gem, and uh, I really uh, encourage um, any of you to come and visit us as soon as, soon as we can. Um, we'll, we'll be delighted to, to have you and to come and visit either uh, Langua, Léoville, Barton or Mauvaisin. It's, a, it's really a wonderful place. Um, um, as um, as I, I said, I, I really like to show maps and let me show you a little map of, um, of Moulis, uh, of the terroir Moulis while you um, taste the other wine. There we go, found it. So um, there we have the different type of soil of Moulis. And obviously there's a couple that are very famous, Chateau Chasplin, Chateau Pougeot, and uh, these chateaus are located on mainly gravels. And you can see how as you move along from, um, from east to west, we tend to have more and more limestone, um, which is what we see here. You see calcaire grossier, which means 
big limestone with the layers of gravels. And we also have Marne. Marne is a mixture of limestone and clay. Um, and then we have a little bit of red and this calcaire argile, limestone and clay. And that's more the, the chalky bit rather than the, the limestone bit. And, and you can see this is everything that's around Mauvezin. And, and this is where it's quite interesting is um, we really have a corridor which is perfect for Merlot, a corridor which is perfect for, uh, uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon. And, and actually both sides are very good for Cabernet Sauvignon. And, um, and Moulis is, is a nice appellation for this because you can see that there's a lot of patchwork in terms of the soil, there's a lot of different style of, of wine. And for such a small appellation, you get fantastic values in, in most, of the, most of this appellation, although it's not yet extremely famous. Yes, Moulis, Moulis is 600 hectares big, and uh, at Mauvezin, we have 60 hectares. So we're quite a big property in Moulis. Sorry to ask a question. Um, do you treat the wines any differently from the other two estates in the winery? Uh, the vines, uh, yes, obviously. Uh, um, a, we're still in reconstruction of the vineyard. So we're still pulling up and replanting and trying to get rid of the old, old methods where they didn't plow and they tied nice, nasty green plastic on. So we're trying to get rid of all that. So that, that's a major job for a start. Um, and then in the cellars, uh, well, for a start, we, we pick the part machine and part hand, whereas at Longwa it's all by hand. And in the cellars, yes, we treat differently, less new barrels. So it's one third new barrels, one third one wine old barrels from Mauvezin and one third um, one wine old barrels from Longwa that we buy and bring in. And um, the fining also is different. We do fining from the barrel um, with, with a stick, whereas at Longwa we do the fining uh, by transferring it from barrel to barrel using egg whites and so on. So, so slightly less expensive methods at, at Mauvezin, uh, where Longwa is treated as a real old, um, traditionally, um, winemaking and rather more elaborate systems. Well, so is this one uh, technically vegan then, if there's no egg whites? Ah oh, yes, sorry for vegans, you can't have, well you can't have Mauvezin either because uh, we uh, treat it not with egg white as such but with albumin, so yes and don't forget all the insects that get into it as well and maybe the lizards and the snails that have walked on the grapes and so on. Uh, re regardless there's um, um, as we move along we try to pick more and more by hand everything we replant is done by hand mm -hmm. and um, we this, we have quite a large amount of vats which allow us to separate the different plots and then uh, similar to Longwa Olivier, it's aged 18 months in barrel um, with 30% uh, New York. So yeah, I'd like to, to say there's still a, a similar um, uh, signature, I would say. Are you going to talk a bit about the 14? I'll let you go for it. Go for it. Well, the 14 is, is a, a vintage I find slightly overlooked. Uh, I find it's got lots of charm. Of course, if you if you you pick up the smell with the you know with the red berries that I find. But what I like about the wine is that it has a freshness, and although it's quite young, I find it's a wine that you can you know already start drinking. Uh, I just love the 14s because. Um, um, you know, uh, what I call a happy vintage. You know, you pull the cork and you just feel like drinking it. Hmm. Shall we go on to the next one now and try the next vintage? 
Go for it. Which again, I've forgotten which one it is. Hmm. So it's the 16. Uh, what um, uh, at Mauvaisin, um, of course, when we first arrived in 2011, the first thing we, we did, because we couldn't work on the vineyard as we bought it in August, but we uh, took a horrendous machine called the optical sorting machine. And the first thing it did was to throw out quite a few grapes, much to the horror of the resident Maître de Chez, who'd been there for 28 years. He said, but look at all the grapes that's been thrown away. And we said, yes, well, you know, that's what we're going to do today is try and make a, a better wine. And of course, with all the work we've been doing in the vineyards, uh, we spent two years, um, three years doing the new cellars and the new vineyard is going to take, oh, we think a generation, but we've already planted or replanted 10 hectares. So the big difference between 11 and 16, and I find in 16, we've really reached another step. Now 16 is a, is a lovely, lovely vintage in Bordeaux. It's just fantastic, very serious wine. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think um, again, something with um, rather nice ruby color. You can see there's, there's more material to it. It's a sort of wine that you can drink now or you can potentially lie down and, and, uh, and wait. But um, there's a lot of other wines that we say, you know, it's better if you wait. So I reckon just, just drink this one. <laughs> when you talk about um, replanting the vineyard and as you move forwards, kind of looking towards the next generation, how much are you factoring in climate change in terms of what you're planting now and what will be suited to those vineyards perhaps further down the line? Uh, there's a, there's a, some people who are saying, oh, we're going to need to change, um, you know, our, our type of grapes, um, vines, should we say. Uh, I, I think we've, we've, over the years, you know, when I first started, I'm going to be the old one around here. When, when I first started and we reached, uh, you know, 10, 10 degrees, uh, potential 10 degrees alcohol. It was, yes, look, fantastic. You know, what we done, it's great. Uh, and today at 13, we sort of get blase. I said, oh, 13 again. Um, I think it's partly due to climate change. I will, although we're officially going towards a colder period, um, but I think it's also the our manner of working in the vineyards that have changed. Uh, I think one of the more obvious ones is the, um, uh, the foliage. We've increased and heightened um, our canopy in our vines. And as you know, it's the leaves that do the photosynthesis <laughs> um, and, and create more, more sugar. So more sugar, more alcohol. I think if over the years we get really worried about it, a, maybe we might be allowed to water, but uh, that's not in the foreseeable future. But we can bring down our canopy again, which will mean that we can uh, probably, uh, um, you know, get less too much alcohol and less, what if I may say, over maturity. Um, on the whole, on our vineyards, be it Longua, Leoville and, and now Mosa, we, we tend to pick when there's still uh, the grapes have to be ripe, of course, but when there's still some, some acidity in it, which gives the freshness and also permits the wine to age. So, um, yeah, well, I'm not a, about to plant a Syrah or, um, you know, a Pipoule or whatever <laughs> in, our, in our vineyards. Shall I... Um... Start talking a bit about the, the Saint Julien appellation. I think it's a good idea. Well, um, let, let's go. And uh, why don't we start opening a bottle of Longua at the same time? So we move on to Longua. 
The labels are so little, I don't know if you can see them. <laughs> So Saint-Julien is another small appellation after Molise. It's about 900 hectares. And um, you can see that everything that it's deep violet is actually classified growth. And the limit of, uh, of the appellation Saint-Julien is actually uh, just here. So you can really see that most of the appellation is classified growth. Um, it really tells a lot on the, on the global quality of the, of the vineyard. Um, there's, there's really no bad Saint-Julien. And um, I like, to, I like to, to say, I don't know if, if, if Von Romani would then say the same about this, but I like to say we're like Von Romani of, of Burgundy. We, we have, we, we have, it's a mixture of finesse and, and power at the same time. Um, but, we starting uh, with the 2009? Let's do it. Let's go for the 2009. So Saint-Julien is, uh, is actually made of two plateaus. And this is really, um, it's quite interesting to understand how it works because so we have the river down there. And um, obviously we don't have this kind of, uh, this, this map, uh, 3D map has exaggerated a little bit the, the topography. Um, but depending on where the vineyard is and the height of, uh, of where the vines are, you don't really get the same soil and you don't get the same orientation on the, um, uh, of the sun. Um, so this is really where you'll get the main difference between Longwa and Leoville. Um, so for this, Longwa is actually mainly on the Thousand Plateau, um, while um, Leo Leoville is actually on the Northern Plateau. And you can see um, there's a village here and there's Leville Poix Ferré, Leville Lascaz, and this big block there, actually, all of this are the three Leovilles. But then we have our little patch of Leville Barton here, a little patch of Leville Poix Ferré here. Again, there it's Leville Barton, uh, actually all of this. Um, but then we get a bit more Poix Ferré here, and then some Lascaz starting here. So really, really all mixed, you know, one next to the other. Um, as Lizen said, that's simply because of what happened in the early 1800s. While Longway is actually have a, a bit of the vineyard on the beginning of the Saint Julien Plateau, a couple of vines on the end of the of the Saint Julien of the Bichevel Plateau, and actually quite a few, also quite a few parcels there, right at the top, where where we have wonderful gravels. Rule of thumb: the higher you are on the plateau. The larger the gravels, and as you go further down, you get to finer type of gravels. Um, actually, some patch can be sandy, some patch can can really get clay. And this is how we try to plant today, where the Cabernet are on top and the Merlot are at the bottom of the hill. Again, that's a bit of a rule of thumb. But because Longwa have a couple more plots on the bottom of the plateau where we have Merlot, this is why. Longwa usually in the blend have a bit more Merlot than the Leville. Obviously still dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon, but Longwa were around 60% Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, unlike Leville, which is usually closely uh, closer uh, of, of 80%. And you can see where there's still quite a lot of forest. Um, most of this forest is actually uh, could have vineyards on. It's uh, if we pull it out and uh, put some vines, we will make more Saint Julien. But uh, we do like to keep our forests. So it's, it's really a, a choice that we've made to, to keep the forest here. Knowing that in the forests, you have the bees and the insects that will go and combat the, the creatures that you don't want in the vineyard um, and, uh, and also stops erosion and stops too much wind and, and uh, you know, potentially help us very much to have keep these bushes and uh, and trees on the property, and the fact that we're close to the river is very useful as well because it serves as a radiator. So in um, in summer, it will definitely give us cooler nights, which is a great asset uh, for freshness in our wines. And um, should we have problems in winter with with frost? The heat coming off the river definitely gives us an extra one or two degrees to avoid being frozen. I've um, I've put 
um, an image of uh, of a, a picture taken from the sky where we have uh, Longway and Livin-Barton here and the plot, and you can really see how far the river is uh, from the from the vine, from the vineyard. It's very close, and you can really also feel the size of the river um, to just to to explain what Lillian was just saying. Um, actually, while well, we're at it, um, so this is one of our nice blocks where we have Cabernet Sauvignon, Les Villes Bois Ferrés, Les Villes Lascades, and just over there you see uh, La Tour. So Poyac is actually quite close. You know, the, these, um, um, you know, from an appellation to another, it's not huge. We do move along quite fast on these, uh, on these little, uh, little bits of, uh, of gravel hills. Um, there's a question, how would we rate 2005 versus 2009 vintage? Um, well, my opinion is that 2009 has um, a bit more warm expression on the fruit. So um, there's a bit more plummy, it's a bit more um, sexy in a way. Uh, it never became austere because it's, it's really round, it's very forward. And I think to me, it's, it's similar to um, what we could imagine um, with 82. Um, the 2005 has a, a bit more structure. Uh, there's a bit more acidity. And so it's, it's a wine that's a bit more serious. And um, I think it's still slightly closed um, because it's, it's still a bit tannic while the 2009 is, has been luscious from the beginning and I don't think it will stop. What do you think, Lillian? Well, I totally agree with your analysis of the two great vintages, of course, but the fives, if you have any, I suggest you forget them for uh, a while. And the nines, uh, as Damon said, they were not too difficult to taste when they were young on primeur. Um, didn't go through adolescence with spots and braces on their teeth and uh, continuing to age gracefully and will probably age for, for a very long time, they'll just change character. But I think that it's got such a, a great balance that if people say they're drinking fives now, I'd say, shame. If people want to drink their nines now, I'd say, yeah, great. It's still on the fruit. It has lots of fruit, lots of freshness. Yeah, great to be drinking now the nines. Uh, what did we say? 20, did we say 20 hectares of vines on Langua? Exactly, 20 hectares of vineyards um, with Langua. Leville is about 50. Uh, why don't we open another bottle of Langua? The next bottle is 15, I think. No? <laughs> Come. I believe so, yes. yes How exactly. low are your yields uh, for these estates? So uh, Longwa, we like to be, um, Longwa and Louisville, we like to be around um, 43, 42, 43 hectoliters per hectare. Um, that's, uh, to me, less is a bit ridiculous because I'm, I'm not convinced that it makes a better wine at all. Um, because you need, you do need some freshness in the wine. If it's just pure concentration, um, you lose, uh, you lose drinkability and that's what's really key. Um, but also, and then more than this, then you, you lose, you start diluting a bit the concentration. And uh, so it's, it's a happy balance uh, to try and reach for. Um, but then obviously every vintage is different. For example, this year, summer was a bit dry. So we went down to uh, 34. And then in vintages like 2004, which was a very uh, generous vintage, um, we went up to, remember Lillian, something like 58? Uh, it was 56 we were allowed to make, because I don't know if you know, know about this law in Bordeaux, that every year uh, an organization that uh, partly set up by the, um, the, the wine, winemakers and partly set up by the government called Linao uh, tells us before we pick how many hectoliters per hectare we're allowed to make and this changes every year and uh, in uh, 2004 we argued and we said look 2001 
uh, was quite small. 2002 was very small. 2003 was absolutely tiny. So this year, 2004, we can make, you know, over the 50 hectoliters, which we're usually allowed to make. Please let us um, make, make some more. So they authorized us 56 hectoliters per hectare. So big crop in 2004, but nevertheless, it still made a lovely wine. Um, there's a question, couple of questions here. Um, uh, any thoughts on the Longwa 86? Well, I've, I haven't had Longwa 86 in ages. Um, I don't think I've ever had it actually, <laughs> uh, but I can talk about the vintage. Um, uh, having tasted it a couple of times with Leoville. And um, it's, it's a vintage that took some time to, uh, to absorb its, its tannins. It's, uh, it was a very austere vintage. And I love this kind of vintage that do take time, but this is where the Cabernet really shines, showing lots of graphite and this uh, cedar you know, tobacco box. Um, and the 86 Longwa should be drinking wonderfully right now. Yes, en primeur, the, the 86s were really, really difficult. And when you got to the end of the line, to Sauternes, you said, oh, what a lovely fresh wine to be drinking. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we waited a long time for those 86s. And now if you still have some, they're, they're, they're wonderful. I love the 86s now. There's a very interesting question from Pedro. Am I right you are trying to push the brand investment in Longwa rather than Leoville? If so, why? Uh, you, do have, you, do, you are very sharp to have seen this. Um, it is true. The main reason is that we are celebrating this year 200 years of ownership of Longwa. So uh, we are quite proud of this. It's the oldest classified growth to have remained in the same family. Um, so, um, so yes, it's something we, we're excited to, to communicate a little bit about, but also because um, it is uh, overshadowed by Leville, by its brother. So uh, we want to, um, you know, to, to make it shine a little bit, to show to the world how good Longwa is and, uh, and give, it the, give it this place it deserves, which is a third classified growth. Um, because still some people think Longwa is a second wine and uh, and uh, I think it's so much more than this. And uh, the it's so well, it's so, so fascinating. So um, yes, I, I hope you're actually enjoying the wines you're drinking. How important do you think it is that the family is still very much at the heart of everything that you do um, this far down, this far down the line, and and whether that kind of shapes how you do things? Do you think? I think the well. I'll let Lillian answer as well. Um, my vision is um, is sustainability. Um, in every sense of the term, um, sustainability in the vineyard, because we live on the vineyard. So um, although we are not 100% organic, um, every decision we take is um, oriented for nature and for the people who live on the property, um, us amongst others. So um, um, it's, it's a bit of a shortcut to say, are you organic or are you not? Um, Although we're not organic, we like to think that every decision we make is the best for sustainability for future generations. I'm happy to be the eighth generation at Longwa, and uh, every thing we do every day is to is forward thinking for the next eight generation that will come. Um, and so that's for for the, the vineyard, the winemaking, but also for the for for selling. Um, you know, we don't have any insurance or any banks, you know, any banks behind us to say, when are you, when are you paying back the, the, the you know, the money we've lent you? Um, we, we don't, we have nothing to prove to anyone. So we don't need to sell too expensively the, the wines. Um, and sometimes we've lost money, uh, some years, like 2013, we've actually lost money in every bottle we sold. Um, but uh, it was going to be a surprise to no one that in 2010 or 2016 uh, was a great vintage and we've made money yet. As long as um, the, the balance is fine, you know, we can continue to make wine and you can continue to drink it at a price which we consider, and I hope you share our point of view, reasonable compared to, um, to, to all the others. Um, so, and, and that's, um, but also it's a trust we, we can have with, with uh, uh, you know, 
people like Avery's or any old companies, uh, the history we share together is amazing. And, uh, and that's, I think, uh, the family uh, vision of having a long-term vision is very important in this. There's a question that, that's linked immediately with what I said. What stopped you from going 100% organic? Um, it's just that some years when it rains a lot, having a lot of copper sulfate and going on the tractor two or three times extra uh, than, uh, than normal um, is not good for the soil. It's um, copper sulfate is a heavy metal. Um, I'm being very specific to some vintages where it rains a lot, in Bordeaux where it rains a lot. So, um, so this is why we you know to be organic, it takes three years with, with nothing else but copper sulfate. Um, knowing that in the chemical range, there's hard chemicals and soft chemicals. And that's, that's I guess, a bit difficult to understand. Um, if I can put it very simply, um, there's uh, paracetamol that you take when you have a headache, and that's a very soft chemical, yet it is a chemical. And you know, up to uh, whatever medicine or drug you can, you can take, for example, to treat cancer that are very, very strong and are probably very bad for, for, the, for the body as well. So it's, um, but at the same time, if, you, if you're healthy, if you don't lack of any vitamin, if you sleep enough, there's a very few chance you will have any disease. So our point of view is instead of uh, thinking uh, the way we, um, we'd rather avoid spraying, should I say, that, um, than spraying only organic. So we reduce the, the quantity of spraying we do but we spend a lot of time in the vineyard to make sure it is healthy. So a lot of lab analysis of the leaf, of the sap, um, to make sure it doesn't lack of minerals. And sometimes we need to add iron. Sometimes we need to add uh, you know, other minerals to make sure it's fine. Um, we make sure most of the water, when it rains, it evacuates. We have more rain in Bordeaux than you have in England. Believe me, we have a lot of rain. Um, um, so we, we always try to make sure humidity leaves uh, quickly, for example, there's um, I actually have an image there somewhere of, of what we do, which is uh, very traditional and and that I find very important. Um, uh, where is it? There we go. Um, so what this man is doing, he's actually uh, shaping the vine. So vine continues to grow and usually a tractor comes and cut it down. We still do it by hand because by this we allow um, the the leaf surface to be a lot thinner and there's less humidity hanging around. Uh, the tractor can't do this because if it's done with a tractor, it would come and hurt the grapes that are at the bottom. By doing it um, tailor-made uh, by hand, it's, uh, it's a lot more efficient. And doing this, of course, it, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, um, but it's two or three spraying less. Um, so it's little details like this that um, allows us to not spray um, rather than uh, uh, rather than you know purely thinking what should we do organic or not it's it's really a much broader vision of sustainability we try to we try to have so i hope i've answered the question mummy what's your your point of view on on the, the family uh, family family management oh family management um, yeah, well, we, we like the idea of being here to stay. I, I got the property uh, from my father who got it from his uncle. And luckily I have the two children interested. Uh, Melanie, who I should have mentioned, she makes the wine at Mauvaza and she's a winemaker. Uh, Damien's joined us on the business commercial side. Um, so it, it's wonderful to have a, a follow on. And we think, I think probably much more long-term. Uh, the director of a property will think, you know, just for his period there, we are going to be thinking about what's happening in 50 years or, or more. And we're going to see what happened um, with our ancestors as well, and maybe learn from one or two mistakes. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I think it's, and, what people say when they, they come um, to, to visit us, uh, that uh, there's a, a feeling of, of more family, uh, family welcome, as opposed to more clinical, um, how should we say, re receptionist um, 
welcome. So I hope uh, one day you'll be able to um, experience that. And uh, to, to go back to um, what uh, Damon was saying about um, treatment in the vines and bio, uh, I think, you know, every year we have to bring in a crop and every year we have to pay our staff and, uh, and so on. And if you uh, ever see um, a bunch of grapes that has been struck by mildew where there's only the stems left on it, you think, well, perhaps 100% bio isn't totally what I was after. So I think it's happy medium to everything. And all this uh, business we've been starting many years ago, we, we started about 35 years ago on being careful what we put in the vines, only natural fertilizers, uh, spraying selectively, um, plowing as opposed to putting, um, putting a weed killer in, uh, careful on the water. Uh, Saint Julien, we were actually um, the first to have um, a, a communal um, sewage system. So the two villages and all the chateaus have a communal sewage system. Uh, we also now have um, our own um, uh, manure uh, creating uh, plant, which means that all the vine clippings, instead of burning them, we, we hash them up. We leave them in our, my horse's manure to, and in a few years it can go back onto the soil. So we, we try to do a lot of things that make it much more long-term. But we, we try, we, we've got about seven hectares, I think it is, uh, bio where we try different products and um, eliminate several because we find that they're not quite useful enough. But uh, to go back to that, also, the reason I was saying earlier about all the trees and bushes, uh, we try to keep away the insecticides as well by using more natural um, methods of uh, dealing with the red spider and uh, the, 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 the butterflies and all the rest of it. So we, we're halfway there. <laughs> um, why don't we... Um, so? A quick word about uh, Longwa 15, maybe? Longwa 15. Ah, another serious, serious vintage, the 2015. You see the, the, the tannins are um, um, more present, of course, here than they are in, in the nines. Um, I think the 15s, we've, we've managed to keep the freshness on them, uh, but I reckon the a wine that you would need to keep up your sleeve a bit as you're drinking the 2009s or something. Um, there's a little question about um, our connection with Barton Gittier. So we started 300 years ago, well, in, in 1723, um, that was Thomas who started a negociation because in, before the French Revolution buying land uh, make no sense, we'd go back to the king. So, um, so he started a business called Barton, which quickly became with the French family Barton and Gitche, as Lizin said. And that was sold uh, a little bit after the war. Um, and, uh, and now it belongs to Castel, which is quite a large wine and spirit group based in Bordeaux. Um, so sadly, we have no link with it anymore, uh, other than our name sticking to it. Um, well, let's open, let's move forward to Leuville. So it's a Leuville 12. I love these little bottles. So Leuville, uh, as I mentioned before, is largely dominated by gravels and maybe gravel can uh, can be a bit uh, you know, difficult to, to understand. This is gravel, so it's really big stones that are up to the size of my fist. So this is my wonderful legs and boots. Um, so it's, you know, it's proper gravels. And the reason why these gravels are so important, so 
by the way, the, the picture I showed you from taken from the airplane earlier, that's this, this soil is what we see from the plots immediately in front. Um, so what is so important with gravels and the Cabernet Sauvignon is that the, um, it's not really enough, um, sunny enough, warm enough for the Cabernet Sauvignon to uh, reach total maturity um, in Bordeaux. Uh, remember, Bordeaux is only on the 45th parallel on the other side of the Atlantic. It's kind of cold at the moment at this parallel. So uh, thank God there's a Gulf Stream heating uh, our region. But to be able to reach total maturity with the Cabernet, we need this gravel. The gravel uh, takes the sun and, and accumulates the heat, which um, enhances, uh, well, accelerates the heat up of the uh, of the of the uh, soil of the ground in spring, so the Cabernet Sauvignon it helps the Cabernet Sauvignon to start a little earlier, and um, then there's perfect drainage. The Cabernet Sauvignon doesn't like too much water, so it drains very well. It still likes a little bit, but under these three meters of gravels, we do have some clay where the vine can reach this water. Um, but then also the gravel reflects some light, reflects some heat that it gives back at night. And all these little extra uh, heat and light that are brought by the, by the um, gravels helps the Cabernet to mature. And this is also the reason why we like to plow. And for anyone who's been there, this is also the reason why the vineyards are so low. Um, it's, it's, not, it's very few places in the world where you see the vineyard so low. And believe me, it's not fun to pick. A um, little comment about the, the Leoville uh, 12? Leoville 12. Um, the 12 is a bit like the 11s were a, a forgotten vintage, which is always a shame to have nowadays forgotten vintages. Um, it followed 9 and 10, uh, which took two great vintages. So of course, what comes after, people tend to say, oh, it's not good. Well, there's a, a big difference between not good and exceptional vintages. And of course, they can't be all exceptional, otherwise they're no longer exceptional. So the, the 12 fall into the category of, um, yeah, forgotten vintages. But to me, uh, they have the great advantages. Today in Bordeaux, we don't make bad wine with uh, picking at the best time possible, eliminating bad grapes, making second wine making much more precise wines in the cellars. There's no longer bad wine. And if really it's a total disaster, then we prefer not to put a grand vin label on the bottle at all. Um, so th these 12s I find are uh, you know, great because um, the, you have the tannins, they're quite serious. You can feel that there's progression there, but um, you don't have to wait forever before you can drink them. And uh, the great thing about a wine, in fact, is to drink it at the right time. And I think the 2012 has reached this moment when you can drink them now. And, um, you know, you still have the perfect balance without being the vintage of the century. As we taste uh, the Saint-Julien, um, for those exploring Bordeaux and maybe your neighbouring regions, how would you describe a distinctive taste or kind of characteristic of the Saint-Julien wines compared to um, the chateaus further down the road that you showed us earlier? I think uh, Saint-Julien is really the happy medium between the... the um, elegance and the, the finesse of the Margots. So we keep the elegance and the finesse. And then Pauillac and saint Estephe are usually bigger wines with more tannin. So we have a bit more tannin, more serious than, than the Margots. So somehow we're, we find we're the happy medium between, um, between the, the two neighboring appellations while still having this great terroir. Um, don't forget that Saint-Julien is a very small commune. It's a small appellation. It's only 900 um, hectares with, what is it now, 18 chateaus on it? 
So uh, it's, it's, it's big 20. properties. Um, most of them are classified growth. And the, what aren't classified growth are still making extremely good wines. And I would definitely recommend even what we call the Cru Bourgeois and the Petit Chateaux of Saint-Julien. To me, there's a, there's an aroma that I find very often in Saint-Julien that that is not always found somewhere else is is graphite. You know this uh, this pencil shaving uh, aroma, and uh, that to me is um, something that you only find in in the Cabernet Sauvignon from from that region. You know, maybe a bit less in uh, a bit less in uh, Pauillac, a bit less in Margot. To me, it's really a uh, a wonderful, delicate aroma that's, that's, uh, that is reflected in Saint Julien. Um, let's go for the, for the other Leoville. What do you think? Absolutely. The 2017. So 17 is. Um, is a wine that's that's quite special in the sense that um, in Bordeaux, seventeens have lots of different signatures um, because there was frost. Uh, so just to remind, frost affects only the volume and not the quality. It's not because you had frost that um, the the quality is going to be bad, but it's but for this you need to manage it properly um, and to. To look after frost properly is when you've been affected is to make sure that the different generations of buds that happened before and after um, the frost you've properly identified. So when you pick, you pick only the grape that is ripe. And in 17, there's really been two, two styles in, in the places that, that had frost. So you find some wonderful wine with very small yields and some wine that have a bit of both that are, that are not as good. But there's also places that did not get frost, and Lillian explained the the power of the of the river and how well it protects us. And in 2017, Saint Julien had almost no frost. So for our vineyards, uh, we made it was actually quite a quite a classic vintage. And uh, where we are spoiled is the only thing we can complain about in 17 is a bit of rain we had early September. That um, um, that, that affected a bit the Merlot in the sense that they, they pumped a lot of this water. And um, while the Cabernet remained nice and concentrated, um, we thought the Merlot and Leoville were um, slightly diluted and there was this, this variations of, uh, of style between the two during the blend. So we really did a very focused Cabernet Sauvignon oriented blend. So it's 93 Cabernet Sauvignon uh, in the Leoville 17. And I was telling about the the pencil shaving and I think it shines even even more so in uh, in this 2017 and I love this style of wine. And mothers are unfortunately we nearly uh, well we were officially considered a hundred percent frozen so that was very sad we only made one one little vat of the 2017s and uh, when people came to taste the the primeurs uh, six months after in early um, 18s, uh, people arrived and said, oh, it ends with a seven, it's not going to be good. And then they said, oh, well, it froze, so it's bound to be bad. And uh, I just, like Damien just said, I said, well, you know, it didn't freeze in Saint-Julien. But we, we were prepared, I'll do a little bracket here, we were prepared in that we um, starved my horses and put hay bales out and uh, tried to set fire to them to, uh, because the smoke uh, makes a screen down on the surface and helps prevent any frost. But so we got up at three and four o'clock in the morning for, for nothing much, I don't think, and um, smoked out the village the next morning because the wind changed. But uh, nobody complained, so that was all right. And uh, what I also like to say about, uh, you know, frost and wine in that um, 45 and 61, which are still today considered, you know, one of the, of the two best vintages ever made. In fact, both vintages had terrible frost and there was very little 45 made. So, you know, sometimes these myths uh, should be broken as well. 
between the three estates, has there been one particular vintage that you've really enjoyed working on and, and tasting afterwards? Has there ever been one that you can sort of pick out over the others? I think I have a big fondness that I'm perhaps getting a bit old now is, is for the 85s. I, I think they're just a, a wonderful wine to, to taste. And uh, a vintage that was, you know, easy all along, you know, perfect weather, you brought the grapes in, no problems in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the vineyard. Uh, in the vineyard or in the cellar. Sometimes these very hot vintages that everybody thinks, oh, it's great vintage and everything. In fact, when they come into the cellars, you have to, to be quite careful of them and not over extract them. Because there's so much heat and so much power, if you do your extraction like you would do on a normal year, you find yourself with wines that are a bit unbalanced with too much tannin and not enough freshness on them, and potentially might not age that well. So, you know, the, the greatest vintages are not necessarily always the easiest either. On my side, I'm quite a big fan of, uh, uh, of 2001, and um, as, as these in-between vintage, because to me it has everything of a great vintage, and, um, the value in these wines are, are extremely good. And the other one, um, and that's, that's, you know, considered one of the top vintages, 2016. Um, that's just, we've, we had more than 16 to start and we did not talk too much about it, but I think 2016 is really a, a stellar vintage. It's so elegant. It really combines power, finesse, uh, drinkability, acidity. It's, it's so, complete and to me it's very Bordeaux it's, it's it maintains freshness unlike a vintage like 2009 which um, feel almost new worldy in some ways because it's quite warm I, I love the the freshness of, of 16 at the same time it's really uh, it's one of my favorites is there is there any questions maybe in uh, in the public? I mean, I, I've got plenty more. <laughs> yeah, um, it, have you noticed that as the, the years do get a little bit warmer and the ripe, uh, fruit becomes a little bit riper, that, have you been easing off on the new oak or is the oak amount has sort of uh, stayed the same? Because I've noticed that throughout all of these, the oak isn't overpowering or anything. It's that sort of beautiful companion. It's not, yeah, it's not over the top at all. It's never been... Um... It's never, thank God, Grandpa hated the American style, if I can put it like this, the Parker style, um, considering that um, wine is made to be drank. So freshness is it's really key. And if you put too much oak, you're really hiding the most interesting in the wine, which is all the effort we've put for entire year, raising the grapes. Um, so to maintain this, this well, you know, simple word, drinkability, um, he never was really too keen on putting too much oak. And uh, even in the period where Parker was big, you know, 2000, 2010, um, the wines really keep this, um, this, this fruitiness in some ways, as you say, this balance. And um, the amount of new oak we, we haven't changed uh, really um, since that time. Um, we, it's, it's interesting to know that everything is interesting in a new oak but the fact that it gives the taste of oak. We like a new oak barrel because um, there's a lot more air, air exchange between the outside and the inside. So it softens the tannins nicely, gets nice low oxidation, which is, which is really you know, the aim. Um, the tannins of oak is actually also very interesting because it's, it, it, it's a good companion to, to the tannins of the grapes. They, they, they go along very well, um, but having too much of this, well, with this comes the taste of oak. And uh, we should not overpower the, the beautiful aromatics of, from the wine. Otherwise, it's like having, uh, it's, it's a very macho uh, sentence I'm about to say, but it's, it's having too much makeup on a beautiful woman. Um, you, sh you should not need it. In fact, at Long Wine Leoville, it's usually 
we adapt it slightly over the uh, on the years, but it's usually about 60% new oak. And at Mother's Eye, it's 30% new oak, and then one wine old barrels. And do you guys use um, ambient or cultivated yeasts? Have you noticed any difference coming through on fermentations at all? Uh, we like to um, have our own yeast. Um, just because we have wooden vats, um, it tends to be a bit more um, sensitive because if, if um, between two vintages, uh, a yeast we didn't plan on has you know, came and get itself in, in between the wood um, holes, um, we like to use these, but it, it's the same we've been using years after year. So I'm sure it's all over the, the vat room. So even if we did nothing, it would be the same yeast that would... Uh, that would take over the fermentation, but but yes, we do like to to control it by adding uh, our, our own ones. There's um there's a question about uh, the Portuguese grapes. So yes, Bordeaux has allowed us to try Portuguese grapes. Um, it goes back to the climate change we've we've talked about. Um, yes, the the well, we're quite protected on the left bank thanks to the river, but also thanks to the Cabernet Sauvignon we use and maintain acidity. Uh, on the right bank with Merlot that really keeps you know going up and up and up with uh, uh, with alcohol um, having new solutions you know they, they are thinking about planting new grape varieties and the Portuguese one is uh, is someone to look into I I, I like I like to think that um, um, we we need to do something about global warming before we need to change grape varieties uh, I'd rather keep the grapes and uh, and think uh, a better way to to keep it cool on the planet. Do you think uh, the our only struggle with high alcohol resulting from climate change? Um, the years where uh, we have high alcohol, like 2018, yes, uh, we, it's not that it's a, it's a struggle, but um, we need to have higher tension, should I say. We, we really want to make sure that, the, that you reach the end. So as when we follow fermentation, uh, the alcohol goes up, the, um, uh, the sugar goes down, and the density, overall density goes down like this. And it's a, it's a regular slope, um, and it's a very easy way to follow fermentation by following density. And if we see that the, the slope is flattening, that means the fermentation is going slower. So uh, that's, it's really this that we keep a close eye on, especially on vintages where there's, uh, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of alcohol, but um, we're also making sure that the yeast, yeast gets a lot of air. There's a, you know, we always say that wine should not see too much air, but actually during fermentation, there's so much carbon dioxide produced that the yeast needs a bit of air, so we do regular uh, pump overs with air at the bottom. So all of this is, uh, you know, lots of little things like this helps the yeast to go, uh, you know, through fermentation until the end. And something uh, a little bit lighthearted than uh, global change. Uh, um, if there was one area outside of Bordeaux that you would plant a vineyard, is there anywhere in particular that jumps out? Oh, uh... Well, Mummy, you would know more than me, but uh, we did think about South Africa for a while. Yes, I was thinking of South Africa. It's, it's so beautiful, and I think it's got um, many different um, types of soil and, and terroirs. I think there's lots of potential in South Africa, and I, I like a lot of the wines there. And you could visit Maidelongkassan while you were there. <laughs> we definitely did, and it's beautiful. Uh, there's a question. When did we first sail to Avery's? Well, how long is uh, Avery's? How old I, is I know my, uh, my father was, um, I think we could say, a good friend of John's. Yeah. Uh, uh, 1793. It, 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 uh, but there's a photograph of dad and your dad. Really? Yeah. I'm trying to find it at the moment and I can't find it, but yeah. I've got it somewhere. But, uh, they, they definitely got on very well and... Uh, there's numerous uh, stories of uh, uh, tastings and dinners they did to, together. And uh, yeah, I think you could call them friends and 
definitely. Uh, but whether it went back to generation before, I'm not. I'm not too sure. But uh, there we are. It's already two generations anyway. Oh, oh, there we go. Harido Winton on the right. Yeah, that must be uh, Johnny Hugel. Johnny Hugel, exactly. And 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 John Avery and Anthony Barton. What a lovely yeah. photo. Yeah. They look, they look so comfortable. They, they, it looks like they're really going to sit there for a few more hours. Yeah. The glass of there. And they probably did. <laughs> That's a great picture. Yeah, lovely. I'll send it to you if you want. Oh, yeah, love it. Love to have it. Yes, please. Well, um, thank you uh, so much. That's been an amazing tasting. The, the lineup is just. Absolutely incredible. For me, the, the 2012 uh, Leoville is the, the star of the show. Um, not that I'm biased towards, but I mean, they're, they're all fantastic and absolutely brilliant. And just such a wonderful chance and opportunity to taste these wines side by side and see how the estate and the vintage, yeah, really changes the, the style and the flavors of the wine. So thank you so much for, for putting this together and creating such an amazing lineup for us to taste. Well. Thank you for putting it all together. And it, it's great that we found a, a solution in these rather difficult times to still be able to show our wines, talk about them, be in contact, get, get to see some people and hope that the same people will come and see us and visit the cellars in Bordeaux. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you I'm very sure much. you'll be inundated uh, when we're allowed to go. Um, thank you everybody. thank you everyone it's been it's been terrific and uh, i hope next time we'll do it in the cellars uh where frank is sitting absolutely it'd be great to have you here and yeah we can put on a, a big dinner and a show and get everyone involved once we're all allowed to be in the same room as one another <laughs> but if uh, if everyone could uh, please join us in doing a, a zoom round of applause which is this <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you, thank and, you yeah. Very much. Well, yeah the opportunity to that's quite all right thank you and um yeah we hope to see everyone uh very very soon um yeah either in our cellars or uh if you want to join us for another one of our zoom tastings we do have one at the end of this month on wednesday the 31st where we'll be tasting uh four delicious tasty wines from around the world uh, and then um watch this space as hopefully we'll be putting together another fantastic bordeaux tasting in the near future um but yeah watch this space as and when we've got it all sorted i will be emailing round. Um, but yes, thank you very much, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of the wine. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, and yeah, stay safe and we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Lilian. Thanks. Lovely to see you. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>